Tonight on Life on the Rock, we have authors Luke Burgess and Joshua Miller. I'll reflect on Mother Mary and much more. Welcome to Life on the Rock. Tonight our guests are Luke Burgess and Joshua Miller. They've recently written a book called Unrepeatable. It's about our personal vocation and calling in life. And they write, we're going to talk about how to discern that, you know, how to foster that, and what is it? What is a calling in life? Yeah. We're now going to a video for, with Father Mark on Mother Mary. Romans 8.29 says that for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That Jesus is first, and we are part of his brothers. You are conformed to his image by grace. We're made in the image and likeness of God, but by his grace, that likeness, the, the glory, something radiates in us and it's actually a reflected light from Jesus you know we speak of the church as the reflection of the light of Christ in the world we see the reflection up from this little stream here and it reminds us so that we are called to reflect that life of Christ in the world and Mary helps us to do that she's the mother in the order of grace and we see that on the natural level right there's a special bond between mothers and their children you know, each mother has a special, unique relationship with each child, even if she's the mother of many children. She has a unique role to each one of us in particular. You know, Cardinal Mazzenti, the great Hungarian cardinal that suffered for the faith, he wrote a book on motherhood. And he said that when God looks at that bond between mother and child, he says that even God must rejoice in his soul to see that love, that bond, that connection. Certainly it's an image of God's love for each one of us. And Mary loves us more than all the natural mothers in the world. And she's there to help us live that life of grace. She has a spiritual maternity that preserves this analogy of natural motherhood for each one of us. There was a Polish song that St. John Paul II would quote that said, she's the mother who understands everything and embraces each of us with her heart has this very personal love. And I think that's such a consolation. When we pray the rosary, when we have our devotion to our, we know that she sees us in the most tender and special of ways. I'm struck by the, the apparitions at Guadalupe. When she appeared to Juan Diego, you know, he was worried about his sick uncle and he was gonna go around the mountain. And she comes down to meet him and says, well, why do you, are you worried? You know, do not fret, my littlest of children. Are you not in the folds of my mantle, her tilma. And we see that in the tilma, this fold on her left arm, that she's holding him close to her heart. And she asked him to go to the bishop to build a church in that spot, a temple, she said, that she can show forth her love, her compassion, her kindness, that she can answer our prayers there. You know, I was talking to a, a lady from Mexico recently, and she told me this is one of the few places in the world that Mary is still present there through her miraculous image on the tilma. But she's still there looking at us with that maternal gaze and caring for us and answering our prayers and comforting us. She helps us to have that new life in us that we may truly be the brothers and sisters of Christ. May the Lord give you his peace. Welcome, uh, Dr. Joshua Miller and Luke Burgess uh, to Life on the Rock. We're here to talk about your book, Unrepeatable, and, and person's uh, unique calling and vocation story. And I think this is so relevant right now. I, my whole priesthood, I've always gotten this question. People are always wondering what God wants of them. And uh, especially now we see these riots going on. You see a lot of young people are involved. They want to do something good. They want to do something great with their life. It's just built in them. And the gospel has a lot to say to that, right? Speaks into that. 
Let's talk about, in general terms, this idea of a vocation, of a calling in one's life. Um, Joshua, do you want to start? Yes. Calling is always done from Christ to each person by name. And one of the things that we believe is a uh, is an issue that we, we face is we, we tend to think about vocation in terms of broad states in life. And there is great good there, but we believe very much that each one is called by name. And so groups of people in mass can do great things together and often feel called to participate in a, addressing some social ill. That's good. But at the end of the day, God has a particular purpose for each one. And it's really vital that each one of us be grounded in that. Right. So it's very much, it's kind of a duty, a task, uh, Luke, that we all have, right? That's connected to our gifts, talents, abilities. Is that true? Sure. And there's a specificity to calling. I think one of the most underrated books in Catholic spirituality in the last decade, in my opinion, is a great little book by a priest, Father Herbert Alfonso, um, a Jesuit who taught at the Gregorian in Rome. And in that book about personal vocation, he tells a story about a Catholic priest who was in crisis. Prayer life had dried up. And his way through that was the discovery of his very specific personal vocation um, within his priesthood. And he found that his vocation was the goodness of God. As he thought about his life, it was always the, Jesus as the good shepherd. It was the, the moments of consolation earlier in his life were the goodness of God. And he found a thread that ran through his whole life. And when he put his finger on that sort of unique way that he always came into contact and relationship with God, he discovered a, a more personal way of living out his vocation. And that's kind of what we've tried to talk about in the book is how we can all do that, how we can all find a very personal, unique way of being called into relationship. I remember Father Benedict Rochelle gave us a community retreat 20 years ago and saying, you know, he said like in his life, even to his first calling to the priesthood, he, sa he saw that God acted in similar ways and a repeated theme that he was mm -hmm. calling them again and again. And I, I think kind of we're renewed, right? We get back to that first calling, that first love, and sometimes we drift from it and it kind of fires us up. What, what about the roles of like people's unique gifts and talents, aptitudes, abilities? How does that factor in? Well, one of the things we talk about in the book you know, are patterns of unique motivation. And uh, I write in the book, my wife Brooke and I, we've got six children, and each of them are inclined to be a certain way. They even move differently in utero. And so God is a God of love. He's a God of, of, of one who calls us through our deepest drives, the drives of our heart. And it's really critical that we identify the patterns of how God has already designed us to love, uh, patterns of, of deep motivation. And so there's a number of ways to get at discernment. But one really critical way is to ask this question, how has the Lord already designed me and what are my deepest inclinations of the heart? And there will be a pattern of those motivations from the earliest days. And so one way to tap into God's intentionality is to, is to get at that. And a story approach where we tell stories of where we're deeply engaged in activity that we've enjoyed doing, believe we've done well, there's a, the fingerprints or the, our soul's code are, are in those stories. So it's, it's one really critical way to get at his calling for us. So, Luke, I know this is your forte, right? The story approach and like just telling maybe stories from our own life to see where we really kind of like felt like we were clicking, moving forward, fulfilling events in our life can help us discern that overall calling. That's right. You know, Gifts and talents are a tricky thing. I was very good with numbers. I went to undergraduate business school. And because I was good with numbers, I followed that path and went to work on Wall Street. And uh, because I was good at it doesn't mean that I desired to do it. And I, and I, what, I didn't feel called to it. So I, discernment is very important when it comes to things like this. And when I thought back and thought about my life and those deepest desires of my heart, those, that kind of work that I did was never a part of those deeply fulfilling and engaging stories in the way that God had, had called me. So I got off track a little bit because I happened to have a, a skill for crunching numbers, but maybe it wasn't necessarily what, how God was calling me in that moment. 
Right. And I, I think it, it's important, you know, we have cultural things that might inspire us, a movie or something, and you can look at it and say, well, this is just Hollywood, it's just a movie. But there's some truth there in that story that maybe inspired us, right, that maybe we can look at. I used to kind of dismiss it more, but now I take it more seriously, you know, to look at what has inspired us in our lives and maybe to go back to that. It's often the case that stories of heroes or saints trigger something in us which draws us outside of ourselves, and that's, of course, what a call is. It's a call of self-gift. But the research has also shown that our heroes and our saints, when we idealize them and look to them, they also point to something that we have internally, a potential that needs to be drawn out. And so often those stories also point to uh, our own call, our own drive to be a certain way for Christ and for our own flourishing in the body. Right. In the book, you all write quite a bit about the mentoring, the role of a mentor. Let's, let's talk about that. Maybe give us some broad strokes on mentorship. Sure. Well, very, go ahead, Luke. I'll start, Josh. So I have a very direct experience of this because I, I teach a class at Catholic University called the Vocation of Business. And part of the requirements for all of the students in that class is that they, during the course of the semester, make an attempt to establish a relationship with a mentor. Um, and there's certainly a providential aspect to this. Um, sometimes we just need to wait. But we also can take certain steps. So one of the things that I ask them all to do is to write to a, a CEO, somebody who can mentor them in a professional respect. Uh, and they have plenty of spiritual resources and spiritual direction on campus. They're all very uncomfortable to do that. Well, nobody would ever want to you know, take the time to talk to me. They're these big CEOs. What they find out is that all of those people want nothing more than to share their wisdom and to give back to the students. So you know, we push them a little bit to go seek the mentors. So there's, there's a give and take involved. God will put the right people in your life, but we also have to know uh, how, where to look and, and make some effort ourselves. Right. I think especially in men, right, to that, fa that call to fatherhood, I think when, especially with other men and stuff, or anybody, but it seems like they want to guide and, you know, help people navigate life. I just see that a lot in, in people. Now, some, a, so go, go ahead, Josh. Well, there's a strong hunger in each person to be listened to and recognized and attended to as a unique person. And so there's a deep, heartfelt drive for that. And when mentors can provide it, uh, it's a great gift. Um, often young people don't seek it out, but that's what they desperately need. And part of those things that a mentor should do, you write, uh, is to orient them to service. I even hear that more in the secular world now, but especially for Christianity, that's bread and butter. Can you talk about the service aspect, uh, Luke? Orienting towards service is critical. Um, so a lot of times I think when we can, can get in a funk, it's often due to some sort of an inwardness, sort of a, a bit of navel gazing. and. When we're oriented outward, when, when we're going out of ourselves and focused on the other, uh, it's, it, that's the quickest pathway to, to joy and, and fulfillment. So all of this talk about personal vocation is all about how we are individually and personally oriented to love others. So as long as there's always that outward focus, um, which the Holy Father talks about a lot, going out, going out, that's sort of a, a key to, to understanding and discerning how we're personally called to, to love others and what our, what our personal vocation might be. Right. And Joshua, you, uh, you speak about how this is connected to the very renewal of the church, you know, discerning our vocation, you know, being a servant, you know, finding our state in life. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, for sure. Uh, in the very first encyclical letter that John Paul II wrote, uh, The Redeemer of Man, in 1978 or late 70s, he speaks about how the cultivation of each unique and unrepeatable calling uh, will be a part of, of the renewal of the church. And when we look at the different demographics in the church today, take young people, for example, we see exactly where this can happen. And so young people are leaving the church 
uh, in droves, I would say, 60, 70 percent. And why are they leaving? Well, the research shows that they leave because they're not known by name and they don't feel like they belong. So the, the Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate put out a study called Going, Going, Gone. And so when young people are not known by name, they don't feel like they belong. What needs to happen? Well, the church as a whole needs to attend to each one, to look at each one, to help each one discover his or her unique calling, to rec- help each person recognize that they, they have an unrepeatable gift to provide to the church. And when the church as a whole cultivates that, it is the path for engaging them in, in uh, their calling, in the body of Christ, at a time when there's just a lot of, of, of uh, young people leaving, for example. So it's also the path of love. When we love a person most deeply, we attend to them not as a demographic example, but as a unique person. And what do we want that person most in life to do and be? Is to be with Christ according to how he has already called them. So we believe that personal vocation is that path of loving each one. And it's, um, we've seen a, gr- a great deal of fruit in that approach in our classes and in our own coaching and mentorship. Right. And I, I know, I think it was you that wrote in the book, Luke, about, you know, like some of these saintly figures in our culture, you know, help people to believe, hey, you can be part of something great. You know, you can do something meaningful with your life. Yeah, everybody is looking for examples and and models to imitate, and we have plenty of bad ones. Um, You know, there's a lot of mimetic desire out there, people imitating uh, what other people want. And they're they're searching and they're so hungry for examples um, of heroic love and sacrifice and and beauty and truth. Uh, So it's more important than ever um, to to provide those. Um, I think, you know, the Catholic arts have a very important role to play in that um, and, and, and to, to sort of stir up those desires, those deepest desires of the heart, because people are, are, will always look for models and role models and examples to follow. Something on your heart, you, you share with me that to even see business, money grubbing capitalists, right, as a vocation that uh, sometimes we overlook, you know, very ordinary, not or, ordinary things, things that you know, a lot of people do, not as a real vocation. Can you talk about that? Sure. You know, I love the name of this class that I I co-teach, The Vocation of Business, which confuses some people and especially some Catholics who are used to just uh, one way of thinking about vocation, which is often state in life. And my students, they're they're freshmen in college, most of them. Uh, Many of them have not quite discerned their, their definitive state in life yet. What we try to instill in them is that their vocation is now. Uh, they, they are students uh, who are in the business school, and by focusing on what they can do here and now, their personal vocation, and how they can sanctify business and make even business part of their pathway to holiness, whether they become priests, whether they become saintly business people, and God knows we need saints in business. Um, no matter what they end up doing in life, um, they, we teach them that they can sanctify it, starting with their, their fundamental class in business that I help to teach. And that realization helps them discern those other elements of their vocation, helps them discern their state in life if they focus on holiness here and now. And business is so vital. America does it well. You know, a place that people can serve, work, develop themselves, you know, provide for families and everything. It's just such a I think in America, we witnessed to that in such a beautiful way. But um, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Joshua and Luke, and a great book, and I hope it'll bless a lot of people. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father Mark. You know, one of the points they made in that interview, which I think is so important, is that we are called to find this fulfillment in mm-hmm. God, ultimately in Christ, and to find our task, purpose in life, what he has given us to do. So that, that's our challenge this week, is to, you know, to seek God's purpose in your life, to discover it. And I thought one of the interesting points they made was to look at different events in your life mm-hmm. that was fulfilling, that right. you felt like it was clicking, that you felt like you're part of something bigger and you discovered some greater purpose and meaning in life. You know, to examine and look at that in prayer. Yeah, and I think, you know, something, uh, I think it was Luke who said, 
he was talking about a priest that had, you know, God had led him so far to become a priest, but then he found his prayer life kind of drowning or just drying up. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but he started to reflect on all the good moments, on the goodness of God. And maybe those moments where there was a lot of spiritual activity, a lot of goodness flowing. And you go, well, what sparked that? You know, why did I feel this way? Why did, was my prayer life good during this time? What was I doing? Mm -hmm. You know, I think those are things that we do have to be kind of looking at as well. I always kind of go back to even St. Therese, you know, because she was, you know, she found out a vocation kind of early on. She was 15 when she entered the Carmelite uh, Monastery. But even in her vocation, she discovered, well, she had a further vocation to love, you know, and that was something that she really poured out to serve the sisters. And I think even going beyond just where we God, but really engaging in that service too, really brings out a lot of goodness and hope and uh, a lot of meaning and direction in our lives. So. Right. The, the greatness of one's life isn't measured in a worldly standard. They made a strong point mm -hmm. about having service. That's got to be a fundamental aspect of our vocation, our calling in life. But we are called to greatness. We're all called to great things. We're, we're called to be a part of something great. We're, we're called to the kingdom of God, and that's preparing the way for the second coming of Christ. <laughs> now, we might have a task that the world sees as very humble or small, but it's a great task mm -hmm. that a person we all have. And so we just challenge you this, this segment to, to seek and to remind yourself of that purpose, to rediscover the call, maybe if you've drifted from it. It's always gonna be in connection with God. It's always gonna be through the way of the cross. That's mm -hmm. the fruitfulness for the kingdom. And that's a path to fulfillment. But you're called to greatness. And never lose sight of that. Hold on to that. You know, and remind yourself of that, reflect on that. So we'll send you into that vineyard on that path of greatness with a blessing. May our Heavenly Father shine His face upon you. May He give you His peace. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We'll see you next week on Life on the Rock. We're gonna walk down to the Jordan.